It's good to be back. Uh, I've been out for a few months now. Um, been kind of lurking in the background and reading about things that have been going on in the space. It's been a it's been a crazy like past few years in the Bitcoin space and all these new terms and lingo people have been using like blockchain technology and distributed ledger things and um, what happened to the good old days of Bitcoin. But you know, at the same time, a lot of these projects are doing the guerrilla groundwork that uh, Bitcoin needs at the same time. I speak to a lot of people that have gotten into, are involved in these other projects and just users, and I say, well, how did you get into the Bitcoin? And some of them even say like, oh, I don't own any Bitcoin. I've never been involved in Bitcoin, but I came to this project first, and now that I know of this project, I'm involved in Bitcoin now. So it's, no matter what happens, if you own Bitcoin, if you buy Bitcoin, if you invest in Bitcoin, if any of these other projects do well, Bitcoin is always mentioned in them. So you can have other things. There can be other projects. Uh, they're really cool. And some of them are doing really different things other than finance. So that's really interesting. Um, so it's been, a, it's been a crazy year. Uh, I learned a lot of different things. And I spent a lot of time reading. I think I read like 137 books when I was in there. Uh, and, I, and I studied a lot um, of kind of how money works. And you say to yourself, well, how did you study how money works in prison? Uh, I'll give you an example, and it's a story that I tell some people. Uh, in in the, um, the prison economy, there is um, a, tra a value transfer is the mackerel, and you can buy from commissary these tins of mackerel uh, in soybean oil, and people eat them, people trade them, people buy them and sell them, and you could buy a haircut for two mackerel, or you can get a personal trainer, or you can get someone to make you a pizza or a wrap, uh, because people need money. People need a means to transfer to buy things from each other. Uh, in the absence of, of other good money, they're gonna, people are going to create their own. So why did mackerel have money? Uh, same reason Bitcoin has value, was that it had utility. Uh, people can use it um, as a value transfer mechanism. People can eat it. The inflation rate was preset. Every inmate, there are 500 inmates. Every inmate can only buy 14 mackerel a week. So the inflation rate is 14 mackerel times 500 inmates times 52 weeks. There's no arbitrary printing of mackerel. You can't counterfeit it. You can't turn on the printing press and print more and do quantitative easing. It doesn't work. So it's, it's a preset amount, just like Bitcoin. The inflation rate is set. Same exact thing. Um, but this was an interesting. So people would trade it. People would buy and sell it. And people would save it. Everyone knew uh, that pretty much because the price of mackerel in the commissary never really changed, uh, it was always going to be a dollar fifty, and it always has been a dollar fifty. If you're a long-term inmate, you can store your wealth in mackerel. If you're the barber, you're not going to need to, you know, accept mackerel and then sell it for something else. You can save it, and you can buy uh, whatever you want, you know, a year from now, or you can have some some savings. Um, but inmates are in prison a very long time, unfortunately, and what happens is mackerel has a shelf life of only three years. After three years, they expire. You can't eat them anymore. So the utility of consumption, of, of being able to eat them, the high source of protein, goes away. But this was weird because what I, what I saw happening was people were actually still trading these mackerel that had no value to them anymore. They only had value because everyone believed that they had value and everyone transacted with them. These macs became money macs and they were only worth about a dollar. So they were worth, uh, eating macs were $1.50 and these were worth about a dollar. So if I wanted to go buy a tuna wrap from someone, or I wanted to get a haircut, the haircut, the barber would tell me, you need to give me three money max or two eating max. There was two competing currencies. And this was really interesting because the, the, the inflation rate is still pretty much set. It's the, the only time you can get uh, expired mackerels in the system is from uh, eating max that had become expired. So there's no like crazy amount that's going to come and debase the whole currency. So this was an interesting experiment. I'm, I'm sitting back here with an economics degree, you know, studying this, and like, this is really freaking cool, like how this is all playing out. People, I'm like, you know, watching and writing this stuff down, and then all of a sudden one day, I go to the guy who sells sodas, and I said, hey, can I get a soda? Here's two Money Max. And he said, oh, we don't accept Money Max anymore. I said, what do you mean? He said, I'm good. I'm out. I, I'm tapped out. There's, I have too much. I said, too much? All of a sudden, he's not accepting Money Max anymore. What is this going to mean for the currency as a whole? 
what had happened was, and I don't know where they came from, but someone left a postal service sized bin of money max just sitting in the, in the main administration building. Overnight, the currency of money max was hyperinflated. And, the, and, and, and three times the amount of these, of these money max were introduced into the prison economy. And they lost value overnight. They were completely wiped out. And that was it. That was the end of the money max in, in Lewisburg prison camp. A very interesting story. Uh, I got out, I spent a lot of time, and one of the things that people have always been talking about doing was how do we put assets on the blockchain? How do we make it so like it's a lot easier, more streamlined, and less corrupt, more transparent to be, take companies public or to take a portfolio of companies and put them on the blockchain and be able to trade assets peer-to-peer? -peer. So if I have a share in this company in China, I can trade it for, to a friend for a share in another company based in Argentina. Or people in Venezuela who have all of this land can tokenize the land and then sell tokens to someone anywhere in the world, and that could uh, bypass the whole capital controls uh, all over the world. It's globalizing and creating another application, another killer app for Bitcoin. So my, my, my partner at Intellisys, Jason Granger, came to me with this idea, and he said, I'm coming from the private equity world, and I've put together this pipeline of companies. Uh, the first one is a sanitary waste business. And he said, why don't we... Uh, tokenize these companies. Why don't we create a token, issue uh, 50 million tokens, and these tokens will represent ownership in the, uh, of these companies on the blockchain. So if you're holding a token, uh, then you're holding actually a share in the, portfolio, in the company that owns all of these companies. Obviously, the first thing that comes to your mind, well, this is a security. So we could have gone down two routes. A lot of these ICOs said, well, we're going to find a loophole. We're going to find a way for us not to be a security. Uh, I didn't want to go that route. Frankly, I didn't want to go back to jail. So we decided, unfortunately, for many of you guys, the token sale is closed to US and EU investors. That's just the way it, 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 it's happening. Um, I think that a lot of innovation, a lot of, uh, of, the, of the growth in the space is happening from the global world now. You see, I, you see, uh, such a Chinese presence even here at this conference. I was hanging out with the BTC123 guys last night. Um, there's a huge Chinese presence here. There's a huge uh, Latin American presence. There's a huge European presence here. It's unbelievable. Back at Bitcoin San Jose, it was all Americans back in 2013, 2012, 2013. It was all American. It, Bitcoin wasn't even being... So this is, this is an amazing thing because decentralizing technology is also getting everyone involved. Everyone who could possibly be involved in this project needs to be involved. So that's what we're doing with Intellisys. We have the Main Street Fund, and we're essentially uh, doing a proof of concept here where we're purchasing our first company, a sanitary waste business, next week. And these, this company, uh, which has been around for 20-something years and does really good profits already, will be able to not only uh, have normal Bitcoiners, non-Americans and non-EU citizens, I'm sorry, will be owning this company. Not only that, but because of smart contract technology, we can actually uh, uh, do distributions or dividends on the blockchain automatically as a snapshot. And when we talked to a lot of these VC funds and private equity funds, the first thing they said to me is, wait, so you're saying we can do a, we can do a fund, but actually have the tokens liquid and traded on exchanges? And not only do that, but we can do dividends on the blockchain. I said, yeah. And they said, how do we do that? So this is another, another example of how blockchain tech can, can bridge the gap between traditional finance and the blockchain world. Uh, but you see a lot of cool projects. You see so many different uh, companies doing things on the blockchain. There was um, the Alpha Point uh, fellow was here earlier talking about putting medical data on the blockchain. The, the Steam folks and the Yours, they are doing social media on the blockchain. Really great projects, all experimental, proof of concepts that are working with communities, awesome stuff. And that, it's, that's amazing. So one of the, Someone asked me, like, what's the biggest surprise you saw when you got out? And I said, the biggest surprise I saw was people were actually doing things other than, than finance and money on the blockchain. And that was awesome. Now i got to start like, using this, this blockchain lingo instead of Bitcoin. But I, I guess I can get used to that. Um, I know a lot of you have been approaching me with questions. I want to leave some time for questions. Thank you guys so much for having me. And if anyone has any questions, uh, feel free to ask. I think we have a few more minutes. Go for it. So if a company wanted to have derivatives distributed through, say, like, Intellisys, would they be able to do that? 
So right now, we we didn't want to do where we raise a bunch of money and then pretty much say, okay, now what do we do with it? We spent the year finding the companies first. So when we do raise the money, it's not going to be sitting in a smart contract vulnerable to attack. That ether is going to be spent to be buying the companies. We're ready to go. However, we are always looking at companies because my blockchain synergy plan is basically now that we own these traditional companies, for example, the sanitary waste business, uh, we, we, we ask ourselves with our advisory board is how can blockchain technology save these companies money? How can blockchain tech be involved in this company somehow, save them money, make them more money? Um, I know someone is doing kind of an uber c competitor on the blockchain. Uh, we see logistics as uh, a good example of decentralizing this and streamlining costs. So we will look for that company, we'll look at those blockchain companies that are in the best position for making our uh, traditional old world companies money. We'll joint venture by those companies and we'll force that marriage. We're forcing that bridge now and the token holders that own our tokens own both companies. Now they're benefiting from profits on both companies. So if you are a company in the blockchain space and pretty much have a solution to a problem, come find me because all these companies that we're buying have problems that need solving. We want to show use case. I want to show utility. I want people to, to, to stop thinking that Bitcoin is just some like thing in the air that people trade on and speculate on and don't do anything with. I really want to show the next two years, I want to show us doing things with Bitcoin. We're now in the university years. You know, like we've been in the infant years, we've been in the early years, uh, high school, middle school, we're learning who we are. What is Bitcoin? What is blockchain? What can it do? Can it work? Will we die? Will we survive? All these questions. I think we're pretty much all agreed, and the Chinese government agrees too, that we're here to stay. We're not going anywhere. So now it's like we know who we are. How do we do that now? What's the next step? We're in university. We know what we want to major in. We know what we want to do. How do I get that job? How do we go the next step? We're putting on our big boy pants now. and we're, we're taking it to the next level. People are taking us seriously now. We need to show them that we're serious. Go for it. Well, we spent, we spent a lot of time trying to figure out. So the question he asked was, are we using a side chain? What are we using? Right now, so the, the token is token agnostic. Whatever we use now, we can always change over. We're working with the rootstock guys because I really like to do this on the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, unfortunately, the smart contracts that we want to do, it, there isn't uh, a turnkey system on the Bitcoin blockchain right now. So we're using Ethereum. Um, but like I said, the, the ERC-20 token is a pretty standard token. We want to make sure the token is liquid and traded on the most uh, available exchanges uh, worldwide. Uh, most exchange owners will tell you that the easiest for them is having an ERC-20 Ethereum standard token. But that's not to say that we can't change. Um, I'd like to do, personally, I'm, I love Bitcoin. I love everything else too, but if, if, I can, if it can be done on Bitcoin, I'd like to do it on Bitcoin too. Sure. It's more with the SEC. So the question is, is, are we concerned with the Department of Justice or with the SEC going forward? I don't want to be on the defensive anymore. We're the first ones pretty much doing a securitized token. If we do it and we piss off the SEC, I'm ruining it for everyone else. I know of about two other projects right now that are in the legal process of, getting, of tokenizing their own companies. Uh, it's going to change the way we look at ICOs and it's to change the way we take companies public. But because I'm the first one through that door, like I was before with BitInstant in the early days in the Bitcoin Foundation, I don't want to ruin it for everyone else. I know that my situation um, hindered a lot other people's growth, and I don't want to make that same mistake again. I know where the red flags are. I know where the gray areas are. I know where it is. If it's gray, it's black. There's no more gray areas. We're doing things the right way now. Um, I've made those mistakes before. I paid my time for it, and I'm not looking to make those same mistakes again. Thank you guys so much. Uh, I'm around. Feel free to come talk to me. Check out intellisys.ai or mainstreet.ky. And uh, keep on 
Bitcoining, guys. To the moon.